From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Janet Gaynor and George Brent in Mrs. Moonlight. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater comes to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes. It's made possible because you buy Lux Flakes so regularly. This year, more than ever, you need Lux because it's a luxable year. Stores are full of the new cottons, smart and crisp as iceberg lettuce, rayons and silks and many new textures. They'll all stay new looking longer with Lux. Give them the safe care you give your underthings and stockings. Just one washing failure may wreck a clothes budget, you know. Let me put it this way. It pays in dollars, and it costs only a few cents to use Lux for everything safe in water. Remember, a little goes so far. Lux is thrifty. It's a different type of play we bring you tonight, a most unusual romance of a girl who wished she might never grow old and whose wish came true. Janet Gaynor and George Brent are the stars of Mrs. Moonlight. Louis Silvers directs our orchestra, and Dr. Walter B. Pitkin, author of the famous bestseller, Life Begins at 40, is our special guest. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I want to join with Melville Ruick in thanking you for your loyal support. You who listen to this program are partners in the Lux Radio Theater. It's for your pleasure that we produce these plays. It's your preference that helps select them, and your purchases of Lux that make this theater possible. Traveling across the country in connection with the opening of Union Pacific, I met a woman who asked me what she could do to express her thanks for the pleasant evenings that this theater had brought her. I told her the best way to show her appreciation was to buy the products behind the Lux Radio Theater, Lux Toilet Soap, and Lux Flakes. Those women in our audience who are not already using these splendid products, and I, I assume there are only a few, will thank me for suggesting their use. And we thank each and every one of you for your loyalty, which makes this theater possible. Some 400 years ago, in a newfound land called Florida, a Spanish explorer, Ponce de Leon, gave up his life on the altar of an age-old quest, the secret of eternal youth. And I doubt if there's anyone in our audience tonight who at some time or other hasn't wondered if there really was some fountain of everlasting youth. This idea has captured man's hope and imagination again and again. Tonight's play, Mrs. Moonlight, is the drama of a woman who finds that secret, a woman who never grows old. But what results from this, the events of our play will tell you. A play starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent, who in real life found the end of their quests here in Hollywood. Miss Gaynor is one of that select company of stars who were once Hollywood extras, an achievement not often duplicated. For the odds against the extra are 10,000 to 1, unless that extra has the talent and determination of a Janet Gaynor. When an Irishman arrives in Hollywood, he can't come with a better background than the University of Dublin and that city's famous Abbey Theatre. George Brent, like the romantic ideal of his countrymen, has followed a quest of adventure as a sailor, diamond miner, stoker, blacksmith, sheep herder, and vagabond, a trail that led eventually to Hollywood. He appears through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studio and is currently starring in The Rains Came for 20th Century Fox. Tonight he plays Tom Moonlight, and Janet Gaynor is Sarah, as the Lux Radio Theater presents our adaptation of a great Broadway success, Mrs. Moonlight. Midsummer night in England. The year is 1881, almost 60 years ago. In a tiny garden facing on the moors, a lovely young girl stands in a dress of shimmering white. Her face is lifted toward the full round moon, and her eyes are bright and shining, for tomorrow is her wedding day. But a dark cloud steals across the moon's face, and from the west comes the deep rumble of thunder. The girl turns, hearing a step in the shadows behind her. Edith? Edith, is that you? Yes. Whatever are you doing out here at this time of night, Sarah? Looking at the moon, 
and thinking how happy I am. Ooh, it's going to rain. Only a summer shower. I don't like it. There's a queer feeling in the air tonight. Have you felt it too? It'll be too bad if it rains tomorrow. Oh, it won't. It couldn't. You mustn't tempt Providence, Sarah. <laughs> I'm not afraid of Providence. I'm not afraid of anything tonight. I'm going to marry Tom Moonlight. And tomorrow, I'll be Sarah Moonlight. Isn't it the most beautiful name? Hmm. Very beautiful. Edith, you like Tom, don't you? Whatever made you think I didn't? Nothing. Only sometimes when I speak of him, you seem to... Oh, nonsense. It's your imagination. You'd better come in now. In a little while. Tom's stopping by to say good night. But don't you wait up. My maid of honor must look her best tomorrow, too. My best is only a candle beside you. No one will even notice me. Edith. There's Edith Jones, the bride's cousin. What a pity she didn't inherit the family looks. Edith, what is it? Aren't you happy for me? Oh, you know I am, but... Perhaps I'm a little sad, too. Well, I'm going in. I don't like storms. Good night, Sarah. Good night. Sarah? Sarah? Yes, Minnie? What is it? I have a little something for you, Miss Sarah. Your wedding present. Oh, Minnie, how sweet. <laughs> you do love me, don't you? I've waited on you since you were three. People grow close with time, I suppose. <laughs> well, aren't you going to open it? My present? But I thought tomorrow... Open it now. It's more fitting somehow. Why? Well, it's a strange gift, child. It's called the dreard. The dreard? Oh, I'm sure it must be something very wonderful and very Scotch. It's been in my family for hundreds of years. Nobody knows where it came from first, but it's for you. <gasps> a necklace! Oh, Minnie, how lovely. But why is it called the Dread? I don't rightly know, but there's said to be magic in it. Magic? Aye, there's a legend. It's said that there's one wish granted to every owner. One wish that will come true. One wish? Sometime you may want something badly, Miss Sarah, with all your heart. It may be that you'll use it then. Sarah? Yes, Edith? Your Tom Moonlight is here. Tom! I got away as soon as I could, darling. Oh, I knew you would. Look, I've had a present already from Minnie. A necklace? Well, that's beautiful, Minnie. And there's a legend, Tom. It's not to be talked about. Oh. You must get to bed now, Sarah. It's growing late. I won't keep her five minutes. Five minutes, then. Or I'll come get her myself. Oh, Tom. Tom Moonlight. Do you know I'm very happy? My darling. So happy it frightens me. <laughs> Fasten my necklace. I want to wear it. So you'll be even more beautiful? There. Well, that was close, wasn't it? How still it is after. How unearthly still. Perhaps the gods are standing gaping, surprised that any mortal could be so lovely. Tom, we must always be as happy as we are now. Nothing must ever change. It never will. Oh, if I could only be sure. You can. Our love will never change. But we'll change. We'll grow old, Tom. You won't like me to look old. I'll always see you just as you are now, Sarah. Just as I married you. As I am now. There, you see? What? Oh, Tom, if you ever stopped loving me, I should die. Stop loving you? When I die, Sarah, and not even then, our love is forever. Oh, it must be. It must be. It's late. Kiss me goodnight. The last time I shall ever have to leave you. The last time. Good night, my darling. Good night. One wish. One wish to every owner. Oh, Dread, this is my prayer. That I shall never change. That I shall never grow older. Oh, let me look always. Just as I do tonight. It's my youth, he loves. Don't let me lose it. Let me keep it always. For him. <laughs> Mm. 
Minnie, do you have to do that dusting right under my nose? Is Mrs. Moonlight's cousin's coming? I can't have her see dirt. Well, why didn't you do it this morning? I was busy elsewhere this morning. Well, if you finish, then run along. Well, don't stand there watching me. After nine years, surely I'm nothing to stare at. I was just thinking that a Scotsman wouldn't forget his wedding anniversary. I did not forget it. Mrs. Moonlight's gift is being delivered any minute. And why aren't you looking after my daughter as you're supposed to do? Do you mean Jane? Well, who in the world do you suppose I mean? She's with her lovely parent, she is. Do you mean Mrs. Moonlight? Who do you suppose I mean? Ah, Minnie, you're a disagreeable old woman. I've been thinking seriously of giving you notice. Ah, away with you. Consider yourself lucky to be living in the same house with us. With us? With Sarah Moonlight and me and we Jane. Oh, creature, answer the bell. <laughs> it's your poor wee gifty, I expect. And it isn't poor and it isn't wee. Good afternoon, Minnie. It's Mrs. Moonlight's cousin. Good afternoon, Thomas. How are you, Edith? Nicely, thank you. Where's Sarah? She's with Jane. Oh, Minnie, will you please inform Mrs. Moonlight that her cousin is here to go to the band concert with us? She doesn't have to. How are you, Edith, dear? Many happy returns of the day, Sarah. Here's my present. Oh, how nice. What is it? Mm, I'm afraid you won't like it. I'm sure I will. Oh, a shawl. Oh, I mean, but, but what a lovely one. Yes, I knew you wouldn't like it. Oh, but I do, Edith. No, you don't like it because you think shawls are only for old people. Oh, how absurd. You think too much of your age, both of you. Do you think I do, Edith? Well, since you ask me, yes. You dress too young. Several people have mentioned it. Well, they're just envious. Sarah doesn't dress young. She looks young. Well, put it any way you like. But tell me this. Does Sarah look a day older today than she did at 21 or 20 or even 19? Well, no. But is that a crime? Well, I didn't say so. Do you think so? Well, I don't think it's a crime, but... But it is odd. What do you mean by odd? Just odd. I see. No, oh, please, please, Edith. Let's let's forget it. Oh, of course. It was Sarah who asked me. Oh, uh, look, Edith. I got a letter last night from Maud. From your sister Maud? What does she want? She wants to tell me she's just had a baby. Now, why does she think you'd care? She gave up her family when she ran off with that good-for-nothing foreigner. Answer that, Minnie. Is it a boy or a girl, Sarah? A girl. They've named her Joy. Ironically, I presume. Do they still live in Florence? Of course. His work is there. He's an artist. <laughs> Here it is. Here what is? Where did you get that box, Minnie? There's a little present from me, my dear. Oh, Tom, what is it? Well, open it up and see. <gasps> a dress. Oh, and it's beautiful. It's the most beautiful dress in the world. <laughs> Edith, isn't it lovely? It's a very pretty frock. Oh, I'll be a queen in it. What trinkets will you wear? Yes. Oh, what jewelry? My crystals, Tom? It wants something with a touch of blue. I don't think I have anything blue. Yes, you have, dear. You know, the what you may call it, the, the dreard. No. Why, Sarah. What is the dreard? Well, it's a necklace made of turquoise. Minnie gave it to her for a wedding present. Then why not wear it, Sarah? No. But you used to like it when we were first married. She doesn't like it, no. Can't you let the bear on the lawn? Well, we'd, we'd better be leaving. I'll get my things. What's the matter with her today? I don't understand her. She was perfectly all right until... Until what? Oh, nothing. Only I wish you wouldn't talk about her looks, Edith. It always disturbs her. And well, it might. She ought to do something about it. Do? What can she do? She looks young, that's all. Well, all I can say is, it's very strange. You seem very disappointed this afternoon, but for sure, well, even Edith might have known better. Tom... What is it, dear? I've been meaning to tell you. You must be very, very nice to Edith. Well, I am. Why? You see, she's... Edith's in love with you. Ah, oh, don't be silly. It's true. She always has been. That's why she seems bitter at times. Well, I don't believe it. She probably respects me, but I don't think any more than most other women. <laughs> yes, I suppose they're all in love with you. Except me. You? Why, you adore me, Mrs. Moonlight. I don't. I love you. Dear... Dear Mr. Moonlight. As much as ever. And after nine long years. As much as the first time. Do you remember the first time? Remember? Hmm. You were playing the piano. I was playing this. May I sit beside you, Mrs. Moonlight? No. 
<laughs> Tom, don't. But I must kiss you. I can't help myself. Mr. Moonlight, what a way for old married people to behave. Old married people. Why, go over and look at that old married lady in the mirror. I look my ears, Tom. You don't, of course. Oh, Tom. And it's my belief that you never will. Oh, please don't say that. Oh, Sarah, you've got to get over that silly fancy. Oh, I can't. I'm frightened. Frightened? Supposing, Tom, supposing someone should be born who never really did grow any older, what would happen? Well, she'd probably make a fortune in a freak show. Oh, please be serious. Oh, how can I be serious about such nonsense? But just supposing, what do you think would happen? Well, in olden times, she'd probably have been burned as a witch. And nowadays? Nowadays, we have other ways of dealing with witches. Less crude, perhaps, but just as nasty. Why, Sarah, you're trembling. Tom, once I prayed above all things that I should never grow older, look older. I thought you'd stop loving me if I did. Now I think you'll stop if I don't. But you will, darling. Of course you'll look older in time. You'd rather I did? Well, yes, I think I would, but there's quite enough that's miraculous about my wife without that. Oh, it sounds foolish when I talk about it to you, but not when I'm alone. Sometimes I feel I'm going mad and can't stand it any longer. You see, it's growing stronger, not weaker. Every year for years, ever since we've been married. Sarah. Oh, do you think I'm just fanciful? That's all. And you'll always believe, whatever happens, that I love you, won't you? Yes, dear. But nothing can happen. In fact, I promise you that in the morning you look 102. Now, come, darling, I think it's time you went to bed. In a little while. I'm not at all sleepy. You'll come up soon? Yes, soon. Then kiss me goodnight. Good night, my darling. And remember, I love you, Mr. Moonlight, very, very much. going at this time of night? Minnie, Minnie, I'm never going to look any older. What fool's talk is this? Your necklace, the dreard, and the legend. I know of no legend. I wished, Minnie, it was the night before I was married. I wished that I might never look any older. That legend, Minnie, it was true. No. Can you look at me now and say that? Oh, Miss Sarah. I suppose it was wicked of me to wish. Vain and unnatural. Now, I'm a kind of freak, a witch. We have new methods for burning witches. We burn their dear ones too, Minnie. What is it? What are you going to do? I'm going away, out of their lives. Tom's and Jane. What foolishness is this? Tom growing old beside me. And Jane, a young lady with a mother who didn't change. Oh, I couldn't stand it, nor could they. You'll break their hearts. I'd break them if I'd stay. Where will you go? To Maud, in Florence. Tom Moonlight will find you. He mustn't know, and you must never tell. He must think me dead. Promise. Poor Tom Moonlight. Promise? I promise, if that's the way it must be. Thank you. Goodbye, Minnie. Goodbye, Sarah Moonlight. You'll take care of them, won't you? I... Tom and little Jane. Take good care of them. For me. The curtain falls on Act One of Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent. During this short intermission, we meet the Brownings getting ready to go to their summer cottage on the lake. Come on, girls. Help me finish this list. What list, Mother? Things we've got to get on our way through the village before we reach camp. Okay, let's see what you've written down. Oh, I see something you've missed. Matches. Oh, please, Mother, put some marshmallows on the list, too. Well, Midge, we can't toast marshmallows right away. We'll have a lot of cleaning up to do. 
Dishes to wash. Everything will be dusty. Oh, dear, a big dishwashing job. Hmm, that means Lux. Is it on the list? Yes. It won't take long with Lux. Gosh, wouldn't it be awful to be stuck at camp with no luck? And have to fool around forever with pokey cake soap. Or ruin our hands with wash day soap. <laughs> then you wouldn't have those rose petal hands Archie Smith raves about, would you, Dot? I don't mean that at all. Anyhow, you know perfectly well Lux is the nicest way to do dishes, isn't it, Mother? Oh, of course it is, dear. I want you girls to have nice hands, so don't worry. There'll always be plenty of Lux in the house. Wise Mother Browning. People notice red, rough hands right away. They certainly rob a woman of charm. That's why it's so important to wash dishes with Lux. There's an amazing difference between Lux and harsh wash day soaps. Your hands feel it when you touch those soft Lux suds. And your hands show it, too. They soon look so much softer and prettier. Did you ever realize this? Lux flakes are as gentle as the finest toilet soap. They haven't any of those alkaline suds builders that sting and irritate your skin. And yet, Lux for dishes costs almost nothing. Why, a lot of women find that just one big box will do their dishes for about 60 meals. So be sure to get the thrifty big box of Lux Flakes right away and use it for dishes every day. And now, here's Mr. DeMille. Act two of Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor in the title role and George Brent as Tom. <laughs> Seventeen years have passed since the night Sarah Moonlight fled from her family because she knew she could never grow old. Unable to find a trace of her, Tom Moonlight has picked up the broken threads of his life. He's been married for many years to Sarah's cousin, Edith, and is enjoying a middle-aged happiness. Jane, the young daughter Sarah left behind her, is now a woman old enough for marriage. One of her suitors, Percy Medling, has come to call. In the living room of the Moonlight home, he leans toward her, a desperate look in his eyes. You're not listening, Jane. Of course I'm listening, but can't you tell me some other time, Percy? I'd rather tell you now, Jane. But we're expecting a guest. Minnie's gone to the station to meet her. Yes, I know, but... It's a brand new cousin. You mean a baby? <laughs> no, silly. She's only a year or two younger than I. They've lived in Italy for years. We've never even seen her. Jane, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you have a guest coming, I must say what I have to say quickly. Now, as to my present occupation, engineering is quite a respectable occupation, and the firm is well established and an old one. Furthermore, my father would be regarded by many people as being, so to speak, in a very comfortable position. Percy, are you proposing to me? Well, yes, I was coming to that in a moment. May I advise you, Percy, the next time you want a girl to marry you, just say, Jane, I love you. Unless, of course, her name is Mary. You mean it's... No good, then. I'm afraid not, Percy. You see, I don't love you. Oh. I'm very sorry, Percy. Jane, there isn't any other. I mean, you're, you're not in love with someone else, are you? I don't know. But you must have some idea. I mean, well... Willie Rag is coming over a little later. Willie Rag. Oh, I see. That's your guest, Minnie. Only one getting off. Nice looking young woman, too. Yes. That's her. Sarah. Miss Sarah. How are you, Minnie? Sarah Moonlight. Let me look at you. Come into the light. No. I haven't changed, if that's what you mean. Still young. Still a girl. Only in looks, Minnie. Not in my heart. Oh, my poor darling. Was I right to come? I had to see them again, Tom and Jane. But they won't know me. You promised. They'll think that you're Maud's daughter, Joy, who resembles her aunt, Sarah Moonlight. To them, Sarah Moonlight has been dead for 17 years. And ghosts don't often come back, do they? No. The carriage is over here. How is he, Minnie? Tom Moonlight? 
Oh, he's well. Happy enough, I dare say. Edith makes him a good wife, doesn't she? Mm, yes. Yes. She was always in love with him. Tell me about yourself. Where do you live? In Vienna now. I was seven years in Florence, then eight in Paris. People begin to wonder after a few years, so I have to keep moving on. You, uh, you have money enough? Mm, money enough for me. My music helps. Pupils and concerts. And it's good for me. There's no time to feel sorry. Or to think of him. And Jane, Minnie. What is she like? My Jane. Like you, mostly. I suppose she'll be marrying soon. Very likely. There are two young men. Very nice young men, I hope. Percy Middling is. And uh, Willie Rag. Well, <laughs> him you can judge for yourself. He'll be at the house, most likely. You're late, Willie. The third time this week. Late again. Willie left his little Jane, but Willie soon came back again. <laughs> I made that up on my way. Jane, you haven't kissed me yet. You haven't asked me. Please, Miss Moonlight, may I kiss you? Yes, you may. Twice. Once. Twice. <laughs> Where have you been? I've been to Newmarket. Oh, have you got the job? No, but I probably shall, or something else. Oh, Willie. Now, there's nothing to worry about. Oh, but there is. You know how Father feels. He says you're irresponsible. Irresponsible? I? It's blasphemous. Oh, I say, he can't hear me, can he? <laughs> no. Good. And if he won't give his consent, I'll marry you without it. Oh, Willie, please be serious. But I am. Oh, we thought you were alone, Jane. Come in, Father. Come in, Mother. How are you, Mr. Bragg? Very well, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Has many returned yet, Jane? No, Father. Well, I think I'll meet her on the road. Oh, please, sir, if I might have a word with you, sir. A word with me? I think you know what it's about. I have an inkling. I'm going to marry your daughter, sir. Oh, yes? Oh, uh, Father, Willie doesn't mean it quite like that. Mr. He... Rag is a bit blunt. I believe in speaking out, sir. A fine quality, and I believe in it, too. I also believe, young man, that at the present time you have no position or any prospect of one. Under those conditions, I don't quite see how you can speak of marriage. I regret your disapproval, sir, but I must tell you that I won't let it stand in my way. Really? Willie, don't say any more. Father, you don't understand. Mm, evidently not. Tom, wait. Minnie is here. I'll speak to you later, Mr. Rag. Well, why doesn't she come in? Minnie! Your visitor is here, Mr. Moonlight. Come in, Miss Joy. Good evening. Oh. Why? Why, she's... She's the image of... Tom, don't. How are you, my dear? I'm very well, thank you. I am your Aunt Edith. And this is... This is Mr. Moonlight. Yes, we're, we're very happy to see you, Joy. Thank you. This is my stepdaughter, Jane. I've been looking forward to your coming. Jane. What? What's the matter, dear? Well, Mother, she's so pale. Well, she's tired out. She's had a long journey. Yes. Yes, a, a very long journey. <laughs> Almost time for your train, Sarah. I know, Minnie. The days have passed quickly, Sarah. Too quickly. Oh, there was so much I wanted to do. And now it's all slipped away from me. Oh, Minnie. She must be happy. My Jane must be happy. If I knew she was going to be, I could leave in peace. You're talking of Willie Rag now. Yes. Why can't she see, Minnie? Why doesn't she know? And why am I so powerless to help her? I'm her mother, Minnie, and I can't lift my hand. A half an hour past nine. It best be making ready. The night train is always on time. The night train? I left once before at night. Long ago. Hush, my darling. You will come again. After another 20 years. Oh, what's the use, Minnie? If only to see us all. To see you all growing old without me. To feel left behind. Sarah, my darling. Joy, may I see you? Jane, of course. Come in. It's rather private. Minnie, will you leave us alone? Very well. What is it, Jane? Well, it's about Willie. I want you to talk to Father. Tell him what you, what you think of him. But what I think of Willie is really very much what your father thinks of him. Joy... But can't you see what Willie is? Yes, 
I've been worried that you can't. Oh, really, Joy? I thought you at least would be on my side. My dear, I am on your side. Well, that's what Mother says. But middle-aged people have forgotten what love is. Not always, Jane. Are you very disappointed in me? No, but I thought you'd understand, that's all. Jane, will I see you before I go? Of course. Why do you ask? Well, it's a late train. I thought you might be tired. No, I'll wait up to see you go. Thank you, Jane. Hello, Jane. Is that you? No. Oh, Miss Joy. Do you want her, Mr. Rag? I'll call her down. No, 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 no. Not, not yet. Come down yourself. Oh, this is a bit of luck. Finding you alone, I mean. I'm afraid I'm rather busy. Oh, I say, I've been waiting three weeks for a chance to talk to you. You mustn't dodge me now. Not on your last night. Do you know, Joy, do you know that you're a very beautiful creature? You really think so? Oh, now, don't be modest. If I didn't have Jane, I might go clear over my head. Oh, thank you. May I sit beside you? Certainly. Why? Well, why does a fellow ever want to sit beside a pretty woman? Usually because he wants to kiss her. That's why. Why did you do that? I don't know. I've been wanting to ever since I first saw you. Are you angry? I'm not sure yet. Have you forgotten, Jane? Of course not. I adore Jane, but... But what? Well, hang it all, I'm not married yet, you know. And if you are angry about my kissing you, I can only say... I'm sorry. I didn't say I was angry. I may not be angry at all. You know, Joy, you're a strange girl. Yes, I am. You're not like any of the girls I've known. You're different. You... I want to see you again, Joy. You must let me. Well, I'm going to Paris. I'll follow you. Where will you be? What address? Please tell me. Numero 82. And the rest? Rue d'Alger. Rue d'Alger. Hadn't you better write it down? Do you think I could forget it? Joy, listen, I can't leave tonight, but I'll follow you. Look for Would me. Would it be rude uh, if I asked to come in? Uh, uh, Jane, I didn't hear you. Perhaps I walked too softly. Believe me, I didn't mean it. Uh, uh, I was just telling Joy goodbye. Was that it? Of course. <clears throat> well, I really must run. Goodbye, Joy. And goodbye, Jane. Darling. Uh, see you tomorrow. Night. Jane. Jane, dear. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. You're vile. Jane, don't say that. You are. You're vile. You're unclean. I heard you. I heard everything you said. Now go on. Go to Paris. Wait for him there. He'll make you very happy, I'm sure. But at least he hasn't the chance to make you unhappy. You see don't now... Don't speak to me. I hate you. I hate you. Jane. Father, make her go. Make her leave. Get her away from here. Jane, what is it? I can't bear the sight of her, I tell you. Are you mad? She wanted Willie. Well, she may have him. And you needn't worry any longer about me, Father. I'll marry Percy just as you wanted. I'll marry Percy Middling and be miserable all my life. Now are you satisfied? Joy, I'm sorry for this. I'm sure she's just upset, that's all. Oh, please don't be polite. Well, I'd better leave. I'll miss my train. Are you disappointed in me? I don't even know the facts. Jane told you. I've stolen her young man. But I didn't want him. I'd rather have Jane's love than anything in the world. And why did you do it? You were against the marriage. Certainly I was. I knew they'd never be happy. So did I. Did you? And this talk about Paris? He wanted to follow me. I gave him the wrong address, a made-up one. I only wanted Jane to see what he was really like. Why, you... you funny child. When Jane is over this, will you tell her what I've told you? Of course I will. Promise? I promise. Mr. Moonlight, are you happy? Yes, of course. Why? Oh, I knew you were, really. I just wanted to hear you say it. What a strange, strange girl you are, Joy. You're the second person who said that tonight. Oh, there's my carriage. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go yet. You may stay if you want to. No, I can't. Goodbye, Mr. Moonlight. Goodbye. 
I shall miss you very much, Joy. You're very much like... like someone I once knew. Someone I loved. Dear Mr. Moonlight, will you kiss me goodbye? Goodbye, dear. Come soon again, won't you? Soon? Perhaps. Pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You have just heard Act Two of Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent. During the intermission, we present a very famous guest. But first, a piece of news about a penny. Do you know what a penny a day can do for your hands? Here's what I mean, and see if you don't think it's a beauty bargain. About a penny's worth of lux will do a whole day's dishes. Yes, for about the price of a penny postage stamp, you can use gentle lux, as beauty experts advise, to help your hands stay soft and white. If the water is hard, just a little extra lux will soften it and give you an abundance of suds. How foolish to use harsh soaps, since it costs almost nothing to use Lux for dishes. So keep that thrifty big box handy. Use it for dishes every day. Remember, you're often judged by your hands. Make them speak well of you. Mr. DeMille escorts our guest to the microphone. Columbia University has on its faculty a memorable personality in Professor Walter B. Pitkin. Academic duties occupy only a part of his prodigious energy. He's also famous as an author. Professor Pitkin has passed the age of 40 far enough to uh, know what he's talking about. He decided that middle age and old age were nothing to dread. So he wrote a book about his discovery with the challenging title, Life Begins at 40, which held a place among bestsellers. The author of this book should have some interesting comments on the problem of Sarah Moonlight. So from New York City, we hear Professor Walter B. Pitkin. Mrs. Moonlight in our play tonight is indeed a very unusual character. Yet her wish is the secret wish of every man and woman since the beginning of time. The desire for perpetual youth lies deep in the hearts of every one of us. We think it's the road to perpetual happiness. And yet, how wrong we are in our wishful thinking and how pitiful the consequences Think of the matron of 40 who tries to be 20. Think of the dowager of 60 who tries to be kittenish. If they only realized each age has its own special loveliness. How delightful is the charm of a five-year-old. But would you want to be five forever? And how rich and beautiful the charm of a 70-year-old grandmother. I agree with Samuel Butler that youth is a greatly overrated season, like spring, occasionally sunny, but usually full of raw gusts. Youth is lovable, but immature. But middle age and old age are as deep as character, and character can be as deep as the universe. Nature is always moving forward. If you attempt to stop the march, you die, mentally and spiritually. Life insists that we grow, that we live each new day as it comes, reaching out to accept new responsibilities and new experiences. And it is those enriching experiences that give us beauty and charm and keep us young and alive. People who keep up with the times, people who never try to stop the clock, people who refuse to be perpetually 20, they are the ones who know that life is just beginning at 40. We cannot condemn youth and its lack of wisdom, but we do condemn age, which refuses to accept its own rich rewards. And now let us return to Mrs. Moonlight. I don't know how this play turns out, but I do know that Mrs. Moonlight is basically a splendid woman. And I have faith 
that somehow she will be able to discover a solution to her problem and that she will find happiness. Mm, you show us that autumn has beautiful colors, Professor. In Hollywood again, we continue our play, Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent. Years have passed, long years, which have gradually dimmed the remembrance of Sarah Moonlight and Joy. It's the present day, and many changes have come to the Moonlights. Edith is dead, and Jane and Percy Middling, married for 20 years, live on with old Tom Moonlight. Meanwhile, in the cities of Europe, a strange figure moves silently, always alone, always young, never changing in a changing world. In a music school in Bucharest, this strange girl, known only as Miss Sarah, faces the master in his room. Miss Sarah, how long have you been with us now? Twelve years. Twelve years. Yeah. Have not realized it was that long. Miss Sarah, what I have to say is not easy. But some of the other teachers, they, they feel... They feel there's something strange about me. Yeah. Of course, I know that it is ridiculous, but... Uh... Oh, don't say any more. I'll leave in the morning. Oh, oh no, no, Miss Sarah, you... It's happened before. It'll happen again. What is it about you? What is it? Uh, where will you go, Miss Sarah? Oh, I don't know. To Paris, to Berlin, Naples. It's not easy to find work in strange cities. They're not strange to me. And you want to work here, Miss Sarah? Uh, Miss Sarah, haven't I seen you somewhere? I don't remember. Uh, it's a long time ago. I don't remember. I am sorry, but I have nothing for you. Good day, Signor. The concert season in Paris is well booked, Mademoiselle. If we leave your name. I am called Miss Sarah. Miss. Of course I remember you. You played here in 1904. You. What? That is impossible. Yes. Yes, you've mistaken me for someone else, monsieur. But you say you are. No. Good day, monsieur. And do you want to teach my daughter? Yes. I can give your daughter lessons every day. Just as you gave them to me? What? You gave me lessons, too? No. You did? Then I was a girl. Oh, no. You. I remember. I remember. Miss Sarah. No. 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 <laughs> And the ticket was to Vienna, Fräulein? Yes, to Vienna. I... No. No, I want to go to England. To London. Yeah, Fräulein. First class? No, third, please. Third class to London. See you tomorrow, Peter? Right you are. Thanks for the lift. Oh, it was a pleasure. I say, Peter, is that somebody waiting for you? Where? Uh, that woman by your steps, looking up at the house. I don't know who she is. I've noticed her hanging around the house several times the last few days. Well, why don't you ask her what she wants? I believe I will. Goodbye, Greg. <laughs> Bye. I beg your pardon, but, but are you looking for someone? No, not exactly. You look ill. Would you like to come in for a moment? This is my house. Your house? What is your Christian name? Why, why, Peter. Peter. Peter Middling. Your father is Percy Middling, and your mother is Jane. How did you know that? And your grandfather. Is he dead? No, he's not dead. Oh. Oh, here, here, here wait a moment. Oh, don't go away. Why, you're cold and ill. Come inside and get warm. Oh, no. No, no, I mustn't. Oh, nonsense. Why, a hot drink will do you good. Come along now. Will you wait here a moment, please? Thank you. Mother. Peter, come in. I, I say, Mother, I've, uh, I, I've brought a woman into the house. Peter. Oh, no, no, listen. I, I think she's ill. She looks it. Who is the woman? I haven't the faintest idea, Father. But she knew my name and seemed to know all about me. She knew your 
name? Oh, hello, Minnie. Why, yes. Who do you suppose it is, Minnie? I, I don't know. How could I? I'll go and have a look at her. I suppose she's a very beautiful Peter. No. She's rather ragged and, and young like a girl. But her eyes are too big and... Well, there, there, there's something strange about her. Come in, please. Thank you. Good evening. How do you do? Come and sit down by the fire. Are you my... Are you Peter's mother? Yes, I am. Yes. I thought you were. You're very lovely. Would you like something hot to drink? And that is Percy nibbling. How do you know that? You mustn't ask me questions. Please sit down. Thank you. Well, I'm all right, really. It's just that lately I've had a kind of pain here in my heart. Peter, come and sit near me. You've got to tell me all about yourself. Are you at Oxford or Cambridge? Oxford. Like your grandfather. How did you know that? Who are you? Poor, puzzled Jane. I'm just an old lady, my dear, who's rather come down in the world. Old? Why, you're a girl. That... that picture on the table. It's Tom Moonlight, isn't it? Yes, it is. Was it just taken? This picture? That... Oh, that was taken a good ten years ago. May I see him? Oh, I'm afraid not. He's very feeble. His memory's gone, and he really doesn't recognize people. He hasn't recognized any of us for months. Poor Mr. Moonlight. He hasn't really been the same since my grandmother died. You... your grandmother? You mean Edith? Yes. Oh, I say, if, if you're an old friend of grandfather's, perhaps you could come tomorrow and see him. She can see him now. Minnie, you brought him down. Father. Tom. Tom Moonlight. Who? Who is that over there? Father. He doesn't know you, Mother. He's staring at her. Oh, my dear. I've been asleep. Yes, Tom. Has Edith gone? Edith? Yes, dear. She's gone. Mm, well, that's good. I'm worried about Edith. Worried about what you told me this evening. I've been thinking it over, and I believe you're right. Edith is in love with me. Of course she is, darling. We all are. Ah, uh, including you, eh? A little while ago it was all except you. Was it, Mr. Moonlight? Perhaps I've grown older since then. Have you indeed? Well... I'll tell you a secret. I never believed you. You love me very much indeed. Clever Mr. Moonlight. Grandfather, who is she? Who is she? Why, that's my wife, young man. Who are you? I? I'm Peter. Well, I don't know you, sir. And I don't much want to. Grandfather, what is your wife called? She's called Sarah, of course. Sarah Moonlight. Percy, he thinks it's his first wife. What are they saying? Don't they like my Sarah? Well, of course they do. Especially me. I think she's lovely. Well, she is, too. And what's more, she doesn't change. Did you know that? She doesn't change. Now, what's that about changing? She's worried about that. I don't like that. I've forgotten it. Tom, shall I play for you again? Huh? Yes, yes. You always like this. May I sit beside you, Mrs. Moonlight? I'm a very lucky man, Mrs. Moonlight. And a very, very happy man. Yes, dear. And you're a very happy woman, Mrs. Moonlight. Very happy. I think I've never been so happy in my life as I am now. And I'm certain of this. Mrs. Moonlight, I could never, never be happy with any woman but you. That's what you think, Mr. Moonlight. It's what I know. Uh, Sarah, 
Well, I think I'll go to bed now. I'm feeling tired and sleepy. Yes, dear. I'll take him upstairs. So tired, Sarah. So very, very tired. Father. Uh, Peter, get some brandy. Oh, my darling. My darling. Percy, you and Peter get him upstairs. No. Stay here, all of you. He'll want her. I know. Come along, please. Thank you. Thank you, Minnie. She's been up there with him a long time. Over half an hour. Percy, I'm nervous. Oh, it's all right, my dear. Well, there's nothing to be nervous about, Mother. Why does Father think he knows her? Well, after all, my dear, your father hasn't known anyone for months, and it's just as reasonable that he might think he knows this girl. No, there's something else. But I won't say it. I, I'm afraid. Wait, here's Minnie. Minnie, how is Father? Your father... Your father... Is dead. Really? Oh, Minnie. She was with him. He was in her arms. Minnie, who is that girl? She's someone Mr. Moonlight knew a long time ago. Minnie. Come in, dear. Peter, get her a chair. I'm quite all right. All right, thank you. I'm not unhappy. It was really very, very beautiful. It would be wicked to be unhappy. I'm only, only very tired. I wonder why I'm so tired. Please sit down. You'll feel better in a minute. Thank you, Peter. He just said to me, I love you, Mrs. Moonlight. Very, very dearly. He just said that. He looked happy, too. Jane. Yes? Give me your hand. I'm so pleased with you, Jane. I've always liked your nice Percy Middling. And you've done well together, haven't you? A nice boy and a nice home. Oh, I... I'm so tired. I love you, Mrs. Moonlight, very, very dearly. Jane, do I look happy? Very happy. Are you? Oh, oh, so happy. It's funny to be so tired here in my heart. Perhaps... Lovely. Now, Lord, let us, thou, thy servant, depart in peace. For mine eyes have seen, mine eyes have seen. Mother, look at her. She, she's... She's at peace with Tom Moonlight. Mother. It's all right, Peter. I'm sure she's happy. See how she's smiling. Curtain falls on Act Three of Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent. In a moment, our stars return for their curtain calls. But first, a timely word. Here we are at the beginning of summer, and that means vacation time, doesn't it? Vacation time for you, but not for your hands. Did you ever think of that? You're right, Mr. Roy. My hands work harder in the summer than in the winter. But with gardening, swimming, tennis, and... And housekeeping? Oh, yes, housekeeping, of course. My hands show it, too. Well, you're just the person I want to talk to. Now's the time your hands are busier than ever. They need special care. 
They can't spend hours in the dishpan with harsh, biting suds drying them up and then do a right about face and look nice when company comes. You need Lux for every single soap and water job you do, and especially for your dishes. Do you know why? Because Lux has none of the alkaline suds builders found in many laundry soaps. Lux contains nothing to dry and roughen your skin. That's why beauty experts recommend it for dishes. And remember, a little goes so far. Lux is thrifty. Buy the generous large size box and start now to save your hands. Mr. DeMille. The moonlight of our play has faded, so suppose we get back to the world of reality. Miss Kena, I've heard some whispers about you that I'd like to pin down right now. Well, uh, what are these whispers, Mr. DeMille? Well, they're about painting and... Uh... Oh, I'm sure it was an exaggeration. But if you're looking for a hobby, there's George Brent's, a gentle pastime called polo. The question was about paint, not ponies. There's really nothing to it. Something around the house always needs paint. Kitchen table, the lawn chair, the cupboard. The landscape or a still life. I'm afraid my watercolors are pretty amateurish. But the furniture painting, well, now that's quite professional. <laughs> Could George and I persuade you to do a sketch of us, say, with me sitting in a chair and George standing behind with his hand on my shoulder? <laughs> I'd be delighted to, but I'm afraid portraits are beyond me. If you draw a picture of an orange and it doesn't look like an orange, you can always say it's impressionistic. That doesn't go with portraits, at least not when the living originals do the judging. Why hasn't somebody seen one of these pictures? Mm, I keep them locked up. But you can look at the lawn chairs I paint at any time. I used a special weatherproof paint. We could have used some of that and the rains came. I doubt if there has ever been so much rain in California before. <laughs> <laughs> and photographing rain is a difficult operation, too. It has to be done on a clear day to get enough light. Yes, yes. Well, if it was a cloudy day and looked like rain, we made sunshine scenes indoors on a soundstage. Now, that's not so crazy as it seems if you think it over. Mm. Well, I'll figure it? it out on the way home. <laughs> and I think it's time to leave now. Well, I recognize a gentle hint. Good night, C.B. Mm -hmm. I hope the man in the moonlight and Mrs. Moonlight shine long in clear skies. All of you, I'm sure, will want to join us again a week from tonight when you hear the announcement of our stars and play, which Mr. DeMille brings you in a moment. Assisting in our cast tonight were Janet Young as Minnie, Jane Gilbert as Jane, Ted Osborne as Willie Ragg, Claire Vadera as Edith, James Eagles as Peter, Eric Snowden as Percy Midling, Lou Merrill as Heinrich, Frank Nelson as Bonelli, Jane Morgan as Frau Muller, and Eddie Kane as ticket agent. The play Mrs. Moonlight was written by Ben W. Levy. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studio, where he directed music for Second Fiddle. Don't miss the Lux Daytime Radio program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan. This human and gripping story of a young, attractive woman doctor is brought to you every afternoon, Monday through Friday. For the time and station, see your newspaper. The Life and Love of Dr. Susan comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Your host, Mr. DeMille. Scattered along the boundary between the United States and Mexico are colorful, exciting jumping-off places called border towns. To such a place we take you next Monday night in a melodrama of a disillusioned man who crushes his ideals in a scramble for money and power. Into his life come two girls, and the mark they leave upon it is told in our adaptation of the hit picture, Border Town. And bringing Border Town to our microphone are three stars, outstanding in popularity and talent. Donna Michi, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Donna Michi, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor in Border Town. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The announcer has been Melville Ruiz. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>